I decided I would do something very simple, not ask you to think. I just want to deal with stuff people keep saying is true that is obviously not true. Uh, and everyone has known it for a long time. And that you should you know, pull a few things out of this, like when people start talking about the uh, convergence of dialogue and science uh, and how you know, the, the struggle to get over time to truth, well, you know, there's one thing I learned about time and economics. Yeah, they abolish it. It doesn't lead to any convergence. They just go round and round. Oh, no, what have I done? Um, uh, so uh, we can just skip this. Uh, but the main thing I uh, want to stress is that in economics and poli-sci, facts are really much harder to find than you think. Um, you're, you get statistical series that often are, you know, just they're done by some government or they're done by somebody else. And lots of things that you'd think anybody would like to know, you can't find any statistics on. But then uh, pure questions of fact, uh, like who did what to whom, they cannot be found. So I decided I would go into stuff I have researched, pull out from the crypt of horrible examples some things that are commonly said and obviously wrong. Now, uh, my, f my first case, some YSI folks have heard this because I had a sort of direct discussion with Adam Tooze one, and Adam wrote a book on uh, the U.S. between World War I and 1931, and he tells, he assured us that uh, Herbert Hoover in his moratorium discussions uh, never talked to bankers. Now, I thought, God, is that strange? Because, uh, in fact, I had seen enormous amounts of phone conversations between Hoover and the bankers. They were in the Lamont Library. This is one of them. I had published this back 30-some years ago. Uh, that's the first page. Um, and there are probably 200 pages of stuff in there. And I went on and on. Now, you know, how could you find out that Hoover never talked to the banks? Well, what he actually did was do what most historians do, which is they went and cited some other historian who didn't do any primary research. Now, I should add, just so we're clear, uh, Adam Tooze is generally a very good historian. I reviewed his first book for the Journal of Economic Literature. I thought it was really good and said so. But now it's not so hot to just do the uh, rundown of the literature. There's no substitute for looking at facts. Um, if you were to pursue this, you would discover that Barry Eichengreen's discussion of the 1931 crisis, this doesn't come up anywhere. The fact that the president of the United States in 1931 is doing exactly what the president, or more, more in that particular case in 2008, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Fed, they're talking with most of the significant economic actors. That's what you should expect in an economic crisis. That's what actually happens, and it always happens. But, you know, you read the histories, you don't see it. Um, here's another case that's had an enormous influence. It has a deleterious influence right down in the New York Times even today. When I was a young student, I was in fact a young student once back in the 20th Egyptian dynasty or so, um, and the, you know, you want to be a young scholar? It sounded like a great idea to me, but I don't know. If, I mean, uh, there was a guy named Ponce de Leon. He tried. It didn't work, and I don't think it will work for me. Uh, so I wish you all well. Anyway, um, Bauer, Poole, and Dexter uh, wrote a book, American Business and Public Policy. I'm just, just I don't want to be accused of bias. Um, what it claimed to show was they, by interviews um, and then some, um, some other evidence, but mostly interview data, that uh, the, the, re the renewal of the reciprocal trade legislation in the Eisenhower period was done by a bunch of people who didn't have any, by bi by businesses with no information, no interest, couldn't figure out what they wanted. Uh, it caused an enormous stir when it was published. Um, it, you know, was in, this is the 1950s, right? Everybody was very happy to learn that economics didn't have much to do with anything going on in their world. It was hugely celebrated. It made the careers of all three scholars involved. Um, now, it got crazier because then Theodore Lowy wrote a very famous review uh, of it where he tried to do a typology uh, of, well, maybe there's some redistributive politics and some other stuff. The problem is the whole thing uh, is wrong. Now, I, I guess I'll tell this story in public for the first time, though there are people in this room who heard me tell it almost the time it happened. When I joined the MIT faculty, Charles Kindleberger said to me, just blunt as could be, um, that he didn't respect 
Bauer, Poole, and Dexter. Uh, Poole uh, was my colleague in the department at MIT, said they threw away their data. They knew perfectly well that it wasn't true. I have no way of attesting to that. I can't say that. Uh, but what I can say is this. Uh, much of the discussion settled on uh, the Committee for Economic Development, which at the time, as Orsula and other people have noticed, was one of the most powerful business associations in the United States. Now, years later, somebody smuggled, they didn't smuggle, they were in there legally, and they gave, I happened to see the file. Um, what this turned out to be written across there, this was one of the most controversial statements um, in the history of the organization. They were, in fact, killing each other over this stuff, and they all knew what they wanted. Now, what was striking to me is that Bauer and Poole were consultants to the Committee for Economic Development around the time they were writing the book. Uh, this is something, I think, of a problem, but I'm not trying to tell you who, what was in anyone's mind. Uh, but that whole discussion is just garbage, and the entire, it's had an enormous impact even on economic uh, uh, discussions by economists of trade theory because everybody thinks it's true. It's not true. It never was true. Um, now, my final case is this thing I keep seeing. Uh, this has to do with, yes, 1931. This one is the fabled story of the Credit Anstalt, uh, which went bust in early May, not late May, early May. And then in the standard stories of the Depression, took down the whole of Germany and indeed all of Central Europe. Um, now Peter Temin and I, when we went back through the, uh, the bank balance sheets of the period, we figured out pretty fast this couldn't possibly be true. And we published it. It uh, caused a lot of noise. Uh, it's now sort of becoming a standard issue thing, though, very quietly. Uh, but uh, this sort of tells the story very simply, even though I see books, I mean, even the last couple, the four, last four or five years, people publishing uh, and being nom nominated for prizes should know better. Um, this is a thing I, when I was in the French Ministry for, Archi uh, Ministry for Finance Archives, I found a Young Plan Bond series. And let me see, I don't want to kill myself here. Um, the, um, what you, this, this is the price of a uh, Young Plan Bond, and it basically doesn't, col I mean, the Credit Anstalt goes down about here. What Temin and I said was this had nothing to do with the Credit Anstalt. Uh, it had everything to do with the fact that the Germans were preparing to repudiate reparations. Uh, and um, the, that word on that leaked for the first time between the 21st and the 26th. And you could see how the prices collapse. This has nothing to do with the Credit Anstalt. My favorite statistic on this, though, this is admittedly a bit arch. Uh, is if you look at uh, the end of May, uh, which is right here, this is the gold in the Reichsbank, uh, you can see that there's more gold in the Reichsbank than there was uh, at almost any period in that period abo above it. In other words, money was going in, not out of Germany. They had more gold, more foreign exchange, more silver, which some people did hold as reserves. It's like, how did anyone ever believe this story, though it's everywhere around? Now, uh, the answer is, of course, you know the answer as well as I do. Somebody asserted something. Nobody checked. It was convenient sometimes for some people. But look, folks, the, uh, if you take anything away from this whole business, at why, it's that you've got to be a lot more skeptical about the tales you're told. And what appear to be facts in so many cases are just false. Um, and that you know the, the fact that four historians all cite each other saying they agree on that, that's not evidence, all right? And on that happy note, I conclude. Mm -hmm.